Hi there. In this lecture, we see Bobby Fischer playing against Miguel Nidorf, as in the Sicilian Nidorf. And in fact, we do even get a Sicilian Nidorf. So Bobby Fischer playing white, e4, and Nidorf plays the Nidorf after c5, knight f3, d6, d4. C takes, knight takes d4, knight f6, knight c3, a6. So the Nidorf move being played by Miguel Nidorf is a really great player, as you might expect. And uh, his record against Fisher overall, uh, he didn't actually beat Fisher in one game, 4-1 and a few draws. Uh, so a very dangerous player. And also his Olympiad successes, in my view, have been absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, a brilliant Olympiad player. So let's see, what did Fisher have in mind for Nidorf? Well, actually he plays h3. This variation has risen in popularity. There's been a resurgence of interest in this variation. Vichy Anand playing it in more recent years, for example. We see b5, and now Fischer plays a very interesting move. He actually plays a seemingly quite optimistic move, actually, knight d5. If he doesn't, if he plays in a routine manner, say he plays bishop d3, and black plays bishop b7, we could get a game like this, where it's a pretty standard position, it's pretty even. But this is very, very interesting. What is going on here? We see a pawn which seems to be hanging. Is it too dangerous to take this pawn? Isn't that a weakness of the last move, in fact? Nodolf actually ignores it. He plays bishop b7. Perhaps he should take it. And it's a center pawn. They are worth more quite often. And even if he loses the exchange, tactically here say b4 and then bishop e3 uh, this is an interesting position where white is uh, doing quite well after knight takes e6 and then we can see some of the dangers but let's rewind here after knight takes e4 this might actually be the way to play nevertheless so not knight f6, that will be allowing knight takes and just losing the rook for nothing there. So let's go with knight c5 again, b4, knight a4. And here, instead of rook a7, e6. And let's say white does go with knight f6 check just to win an exchange. There's quite a price being paid here, actually, after bishop d7 to protect the knight. It seems as though black should have quite decent compensation. The modern engines actually assess this as better, slightly better, for black. It looks as though, you know, white's pawns are weak, black's got that g-file to play with. So yeah, snapping up e4 might not be as silly as you might uh, think. It's not really going into, uh, I mean, as long as you're prepared to sack the exchange and you find the exact moves, <laughs> the exact moves. So here, yeah. Uh, there's there's a way it seems e6 is probably the key way not rook a7 just letting the rook be lost on its uh, square it's knight f6 but yeah okay so it was ignored there this pawn was ignored and we have just bishop b7 the problem is uh, this is a bit scary now of the knight takes f6 g takes the double pawns, yes, they might give the rook a road, but in the meantime, black's position is a bit sensitive on f7, potentially, and Fischer taps into this. We have c4 trying to break open pressure on f7 and still giving up this pawn. Very dynamic uh, treatment of the opening. We have b takes c4. Here, if bishop takes e4, c takes, this situation is actually quite pleasant for white, small edge at least. But after c takes, b takes, this gives white a free development edge. And now bishop takes e4 is played. White castles and d5. And now, in theory, the bishop actually should have moved back. Fisher on move 12 played rook e1. This might be a little bit on the suspect side, this move, even though it's very, very interesting looking. The reason is, well, black responded with a mistake, it seems, e5. Can you see what resource black might have tried here, given that the white bishop is hanging? 
black to play here. Do you, do you find an interesting resource if you're playing black? Which actually does seem aligned to the pawn structure perks of the G file as well. Yeah, bishop takes g2 was on here. It wasn't used. Bishop takes g2. And if king takes, d takes. Okay, white is okay, but it's not like a crushing position. Black is able to use that g file and set up what seems to be an even position. So perhaps this is a, a little bit of an inaccuracy rookie one, even though it looks interesting. In fact, better might be bishop b3, and that has the option as well of bishop a4 check with the king still in the center. So say e6, rook e1, this situation with the check, and let's say bishop b4, so trying to go for knight c6 on taking sometimes, but knight c6 anyway, this is actually a rather dangerous position for black. For example, like this, with the king stranded in the center, uh, it's uh, a very, very scary position to play against, especially against a very tactical player like Bobby Fischer. You can end up getting crushed when it's getting a big advantage here. But yeah, so Bishop B3 might actually be a little bit more accurate given this resource. But after Rook E1, the opponent did play Knight off, played E5. It's another pawn move. Fischer's got quite a few pieces out. And this is now very scary with the king in the center. We see an exploitation now of the king in the center with queen a4 check. Now knight d7 was played. If queen d7, can you see what could be interesting for white here if I give you five seconds to pause the video? Yeah, bishop b5. And if a takes, queen takes, and we're looking at the knight now, if that's protected. Here, actually, rook takes e4. This situation is very pleasant for white. Yeah, black has king safety issues coming up. And, yeah, it's just better for white. Okay, so, anyway, we have knight d7. And guess what Fisher plays here, which is very, very interesting indeed. If I give you five seconds to pause the video here. Okay, Fisher sacrifices the exchange. He gets a massive knight now on f5. That knight is so dangerous in many, many variations. The king will find very little king safety generally in such a situation like this. Bishop z5, the forfeiting casting rights, knight g7 check. If the king goes to f8, bishop h6, we can see how bad this is. Pin the knight there, the queen able to switch to g3, end of game, in short order. So king e7. It doesn't look good for a king in the center, though. Check. Unable to castle. And now, great move again from Fisher with the king in the center. Like Paul Morphy in the opera game, he wants to put more pressure on d7. But how in this particular position could that be arranged? What would you play here? Okay, he plays bishop e3. Yeah, it gives the rook d1 soon. Challenges the bishop on c5. But it did take f takes. This does weaken, though, in turn d6. For knight d6 to be another option. We have queen b6 covering the d6 square. But look at the knight on d7. Rook d1, rook a7. And here, things get ready. I mean, the knight also conveniently holds e3. How does white build on d7? Okay, but rook d6. Now the queen comes to b3, threatening things like bishop takes f7. That's actually ignored. If it's parried with rook f8, then knight g7 check, queen b4 is vicious. And for example, this check and queen takes it with that pinned knight, carnage. So yeah, it's very dangerous. Queen c7, we have here... Bishop takes f7, check. King d8. If the king goes to f8, then bishop h5, threatening checkmate. And here, check. And that's if black tries to hold, rook d8 is checkmate here, as an example. So, yeah, very, very scary. So, king d8, 
But now bishop e6, and it's difficult to hold on to this knight, and it's also protected awkwardly by the queen. If it, if this game continued, black resigned here. If it continued, like with rook b7, queen d5 piling on the pressure and just snapping off, yeah, just winning the queen is good enough and winning the rook. Yeah, a game of carnage, yeah. It's, it's a fascinating encounter. Quite a crushing game. And... Yeah, black should have used bishop takes g2. That would have been one chance to say something back in this game, this moment here. Yeah, if you do have a micro upside of your pawn structure, maybe that's one lesson. Try and leverage that upside tactically. That is, bishop takes g2 would have done some damage to white's king safety at least, it seems. Uh, but yeah, very, very dynamic play from Fisher here. Very dynamic indeed. Queen d7, bishop b5. You know, the king in the center is is a bit scary, yeah. The whole game shows you, you don't want your king in the center against Bobby Fisher. <laughs> Essentially, I think that's a, that's a key point here. He can just build up and build up and then you've got pin piece all of a sudden and then zap. Okay, so anyway, the game ended at bishop e6. A crushing game indeed against Nidorf, who got his name for the Nidorf opening. Okay, one of the best variations of the Sicilian defense going. Thanks very much. Hi guys, if you enjoyed this video lecture, you might want to get more at my course, Kings Crusher TV slash Bobby Fisher, which I had a blast creating over 25 hours of video content. I tried to get the most instructive juice out of every single game covered and picking the most important games from this period. I had an absolute blast creating it, and I think you will have an absolute blast checking it out. And it's at a big discount code with this link. You know, Kings Crusher TV slash Bobby Fisher has the discount code. So I hope you do check that out. Thanks very much.